Welcome! Today, I'm going to lead you on a tour of the Kashmir's district here in Krakow, Poland. Let me tell you a little history about the Kashmir's district. In the 1300s, Poland had a king, King Kashmir III, known as the Kashmir the Great. Kashmir III transformed Poland from a weak state into a vibrant, rich nation. Today, he's Poland's most well-known monarch and is even on the 50s Lottie banknote worth about $14. In 1335, Krakow was the capital of Poland, and King Kashmir created a new town next to the city across the Vistola River. He named it after himself, Kashmir, and its association with the Polish Jews began. One thing that Kashmir did was that he invited the Jews of Europe to come to Poland. He did that intentionally to bring their economic wealth and expertise into Polish society. He also allowed Jews to settle in Krakow and gave them certain rights Jews never had before anywhere in Europe. One example being, Jewish children used to be kidnapped to be forced into Christianity. He outlawed that under the penalty of death. With anti-Semitism on the rise in Poland during the 15th century, the Polish king, John Albert, forced all the Krakow Jews to move to the Kashmir, and a separate Jewish quarter with its own interior walls was established. It encompassed only a fifth of Kashmir, but held half its population. For centuries afterward, it will be the home to Jewish life in Poland, a life that was only extinguished with the Nazi occupation. Before I take you around Kashmir, it's very important to know that the Kashmir district was not the site of the Jewish ghetto of the Nazi era. The Krakow ghetto was south of Kashmir in an area known as Pagusha. Despite this fact, many of the ghetto scenes from Schindler's List was filmed here, and I'll show you those places as well. So our first stop in Kashmir takes us to the Old Synagogue, appropriately named because it's the oldest synagogue in all of Poland. Behind me is the oldest synagogue in Poland today. It was built in the 15th century before Christopher Columbus even discovered America. And from the 1400s all the way until World War II, this was the center of Jewish life in Krakow. Of course, when the Nazis came, things changed dramatically. This synagogue was closed, it was looted, its Torahs destroyed, and fortunately though, it survived because it was used to store ammunition for the Nazi war effort, believe it or not. But this is a view of what they call the Old Synagogue here in Krakow. Mr. Pushko, these walls look really sturdy. What's up with that? Okay, the reason why the walls of the old synagogue here look really sturdy is because they actually built the old synagogue to withstand a siege. Hey, it's the 14th century. Poland's in constant warfare. You never know what's going to happen here in Krakow. So they called the old synagogue a symbol of a fortress synagogue. It was built to withstand a battle. As you can see, it's been heavily reinforced and looks pretty strong. Again, an example of a fortress synagogue designed to withstand wars and sieges. What is this? Okay, obviously it's in Polish. You might not get exactly what it is, so let me tell you. We're right here next to the old synagogue, and this is a memorial to what happened during the Holocaust. In 1943, 30 people were lined up against this wall right here by the Nazis and executed. And it was a big thing because they were shot and executed all in rows right next to a place of worship. So to commemorate what the Nazis did, right here at this wall, they placed this memorial to the victims. Today, the old synagogue serves as a museum to remind visitors of Krakow's Jewish past. There's even an American connection to the synagogue. In the entrance hall, there's a plaque commemorating the leader of the 1794 Polish uprising against the Russians, Tadeusz Kosciuszko. He had been a brigadier general in the Continental Army and returned to Poland after the war was over. 
On the plaque is a quote that he supposedly said upon arriving at the old synagogue to gain Jewish support. The Jews have proven to the world that in any human crisis, they do not spare their own lives. Although Kosciuszko's uprising was not successful, he became a Polish national hero. Our next stop is just north of the old synagogue, Sheroka Square. The buildings which surround the square once belonged to important rabbis, and now it is the center of a Jewish revival in Krakow. A recent influx of European and American Jews have opened Jewish restaurants and bookstores around the square. And it also has a memorial to the 65,000 Krakow Jews who were victims of the Nazis. In addition to historical structures here in the Jewish district, it was also where they filmed the majority of Schindler's List. I'm at the site of one of the famous scenes. During the Krakow liquidation, Ishak Stern came out this door an SS officer demanded to see his card. He showed him his card, and then he forced Stern over here into a line of people. And at the same time, people were afraid what the SS were doing. A boy ran right down this street here and was brought back by two SS guys, who then one of them shot him right through the chest and feathers came out his back. So Schindler's List was filmed right here at this very spot. In these still images from the scene, you can clearly see the old synagogue in the background. On the other side of Shroga Square is the new synagogue, also known as the Rimu or Rama synagogue. During the 16th century, the Jewish population of Krakow was expanding, and so they built a second synagogue right here down the street from the old synagogue. It was called the New Synagogue, or the Rimu Synagogue. It was called the Rimu Synagogue because it was named after a rabbi that went under the name of Rimu. It lasted for centuries, but during World War II, of course, the Nazis went into the synagogue, they looted and destroyed everything, and it was used as a storehouse for firefighting equipment. And today, just like the old synagogue, the New Synagogue, or the Rimu Synagogue, is a museum open to the public. RIMU was just one of many acronyms to describe Rabbi Moses Isserus. He is known as one of the most important Jewish legal scholars of all time. His decisions on Jewish law still define traditions in several Orthodox Jewish communities today. Behind the new synagogue lies the Old Jewish Cemetery. The Jewish community also had a cemetery right here in the district. The cemetery was basically in operation from the 1500s all the way to the year 1800 when it stopped because it was filled. It's filled with numerous, numerous old tombstones as you can see. The Nazis removed a lot of the tombstones and either destroyed them or moved them to concentration camps where they served as roads such as in the infamous film Schindler's List. One of the most important graves, though, in the cemetery was left untouched. I mentioned before the Rimu Synagogue. Well, the man, Rabbi Rimu, is actually buried here and his tomb remained intact. If you look through here, and if you go all the way over towards the structure near that old tree, the big white tombstone in the middle, that is the tombstone of Rabbi Rimu. Now, legend has it that when the Nazis ordered the desecration of the rabbi's grave, the locals refused to take part, fearing the power of his ghost, as both he and the site were considered holy even by Gentiles, thus saving the site for us to see today. A couple blocks away from the cemetery is the Ishak Synagogue. Called so because it was built by Ishak Yackles, a wealthy banker. Unlike the old and new synagogues, it has its own current contribution to the Jewish community in Krakow. 17th century, the Jewish community of Krakow still was expanding, and so they needed yet another synagogue. And so they built this synagogue in 1644. 
It's the Ishak Synagogue. It's a little bit special because during World War II, just like all the other synagogues, they ransacked and looted it, but it was returned to the Jewish community, and today it is the Jewish district's operational Orthodox synagogue. So it's still in use today. It's not a museum like the other synagogues around the district. So behind me is the Orthodox temple, and as you can see, there are two staircases. That's because in all Orthodox temples, men and women have to sit on opposite sides. So you have one staircase for the men to walk up and sit on their side for the service, and the other staircase for the women to walk up and sit on their side of the service. And then when they come down, they meet in the middle so that the married couples can meet back together and leave from the temple. On the eastern end of the Jewish Quarter lies a couple filming locations from Schindler's List. The first is at Siemna Street, where Paul Dick Pfefferberg pretended to move luggage in order to get past Eamon Get and his men. The other is on Miselsa Street, where we saw the apartments being ransacked and the scene where Dunka comes down the staircase and meets the Jewish police boy Adam. Hello, Adam. Hello, Dunka. As we make our way back to Shiroka Square, we pass by the High Synagogue which, just like the Ishak Synagogue, has its own story in the history of post-Holocaust Krakow. I'm standing behind what is called the High Synagogue here in the Jewish district of Krakow. It's called the High Synagogue because when it was built in the 1550s, it was the tallest synagogue in all of Krakow. It's got a little important history to it as well. During World War II, just like all the other synagogues, it was ransacked and looted by the Nazis. Since the 1950s, they have been trying to repair the synagogue from the Nazis' destruction. And to this very day, it's still ongoing. It goes to show you just how destructive the Nazis were to the Jewish community. But thanks to the efforts of the Polish government, even though there's a small Jewish community today, they have kept these synagogues alive by using them as museums and, of course, to show the Polish people and everyone around the world today just the importance of how the Jewish community was to the people of Poland up until the Holocaust. Before we end our tour, there's one more important part of the Jewish district worth mentioning. Mr. Butchko, what is this? Okay. Now you might ask yourself, what is this all this scaffolding about? This is actually critically important. After World War II, the Jewish population of Krakow went from 68,000 to just 150. Basically, you know, the, the Jewish community in Krakow was gone. So starting in 1988, they decided that they were going to hold a Jewish cultural festival. And it has become extremely popular. A lot of people attend it. And it happens in late June, early July, and we just happen to be here during the Jewish Cultural Festival. So this is all the scaffolding I've made to have for a concert that's going to happen in just a few days here. It's very important for the survival of the Jewish community in Krakow today. The main goal of the festival is to educate people about Jewish culture, history, and spirituality, which flourished in Poland before the Holocaust. So that concludes our tour. I hope you saw many things and learned a lot about the Jewish community of Krakow. And of course, I'll, I'll see you on the next in-class field trip. Shalom!